last year, I had never made a map. So just to <laughs> set expectations appropriately. Um, I come from a background in marketing, actually. For about 10 years, I worked in nonprofit marketing. Um, and last May, I wandered into an education tech hack hackathon, actually. Um, never been to a hackathon before. The extent of my code experience prior to that had been uh, basically managing HTML uh, emails for uh, a few different nonprofits. Um, I'm trying to think, how will we be? Are you good? Thank you. Um, so one of the things that got me into this was being both stubborn and naive. Um, to give some background, um, when I showed up to this hackathon, I had no idea what I was going to do, but I had some experience doing design for marketing emails, some like light front-end WordPress customization. And it was a bunch of developers and myself, so I figured I would offer some design services for any team that needed it. Um, and I turned out working on a visualization of um, the school district's budget in Philadelphia. Um, the D3 sunburst diagram based on newly released school district budget um, data for the first time uh, released in machine readable format. But one of the interesting things about that exercise was that um, you know the CSS background that I had from just doing basic web page design translated pretty easily once I understood of how, how it worked. Um, and I was lucky to work with a developer who actually was the local coordinator of our chapter for Code for America, the brigade as they call them. Um, and I ended up getting really fascinated with the amount of open data that we had available to us in Philadelphia. Um, Philly was home to two of the first classes of uh, Code for America fellows at the initiation of the program. And so our brigade is a little bit older, I think, on average than most cities. And so I started going to the meetups after that um, and became obsessed with the available open data that we have. Um, I think in the first few months, I got familiar with most of the 120 or so sets that were up on that portal. This is our local portal. Unusual um, for cities, usually they'll host their own portal. Um, in Philadelphia, there's actually a third party, sort of a neutral repository for all of the data. It's, it houses all of the city data um, and is kept up to, up to date with what has been released. And then there are also other civic organizations that release um, data as well into this portal. Excuse me. So I started going to these hack nights um, every week. And what I found was the thing that it attracted me most was geographic data because it appealed to my visual side and I had experience doing design work. Um, not a lot of experience, but just enough. Um, and so I started sort of looking for a tool to use. And I have to say the next part with a disclaimer because um, I now work for the city of Philadelphia. I am in no way incentivized to talk about Mapbox. <laughs> But it was the first tool that I used that made sense to my brain. Um, and it was basically the equivalent of taking a crayon <laughs> to a base map and being able to draw polygons without even knowing what a polygon was um, at the time. And it got me thinking about the possibilities. You know, it was nice. The Carto CSS made sense. I'd used CSS for quite a while. And finding, um, I actually got, I think, I think I found it right when the first I guess it would have been public beta of um, their desktop application that allows you to style um, OpenStreetMap layers, so uh, Map Mapbox Studio. I had played with TileMill for a second, um, and then I think like the next week uh, they had announced the release of this. Does anybody use Mapbox Studio to create custom base maps? Cool. <laughs> I'm not used to talking to a room full of people who do this. Um, and one of the things that I found appealing about it as well is because um, it lets you play the whole game at once. Um, if you have ever read this book by David Perkins, he talks about beginners being able to access all the whole continuum of acti an activity the first time they try it. So the example he uses in the book is t-ball, because it allows small children who aren't probably coordinated enough to hit a ball 
to play the whole game and practice running the bases and even scoring. Um, and that was the equivalent of Mapbox for me coming from a completely non-cartographic or geographic information background. Um, and so I got really into styling some base maps. Um, this is my blueprint map that I'm still working on. Um, I started it and then promptly moved on to sort of other, <laughs> other toys. Um, but just the fact that I could do this and then push it up and host the tiles on my um, Mapbox account was kind of a revelation. And I, I realized that Mapbox in the continuum of software for this area is relatively new, but you could have told me that it had always existed because of where I entered in the development of, of these kinds of tools. Um, and I wouldn't have known any different, differently. I started playing with some open data and discovered CartoDB. Um, this was a set that was actually just released um, in December by the General Services Administration. All of the registered, this is the registrar level information. So the squirrely thing about it is it's exactly what people typed in when they registered domains. <laughs> so um, it was full of a lot of really bad data and stuff that wasn't going to geocode for me. And so it was a bit of a crash course in um, data hygiene and why you shouldn't use Ge Google's geocoder unless you understand the fact that it's going to put dots on a map, even if it tells you that they're not, you know, represents that they're accurate, even though it's just inferring things um, from some of the other data available to it. So I started thinking about what I'd always wanted to do with mapping at this point. And one of the questions I've always had is, where can I park in Philadelphia? Has anybody seen Parking Wars that show on AMC? Oh, okay. It's been off for a couple years. Um, the situation is so bad there in terms of signage and um, fluctuating rules, selectively enforced areas, that there was a show that ran for five seasons on AMC. Uh, I think it's on Netflix, and it's actually pretty funny. <laughs> um, you have the mix of mouthy Philadelphians and a bunch of PEOs that are walking the streets trying to enforce stuff, yelling at people who are buying cheesesteaks. It's so ter stere painfully stereotypical. Um, but it actually was pretty entertaining. And so I decided that, you know, why not make a map of all the parking rules in Philadelphia? Um, I mentioned being naive earlier. Um, I now know that Philadelphia probably has the most complicated use case for um, mapping the regulations for on-street parking. I've done a sort of informal survey of the available data from other cities. I didn't even realize that there are cities that have sort of blanket citywide rules in terms of uh, windows when you can and cannot park on certain streets. That doesn't exist in Philadelphia. It is a block by block situation. And compounded by the fact that the city's enforcement is done by a state agency, uh, the Philadelphia Parking Authority is actually run by the state, and the, their largest or their only client is the city of Philadelphia. So um, how many people have done a lot of work with open data before? Right. And you know it's sort of the never-ending war to have to, to release data. And then you're dealing with aged systems on the government side um, and employees who, for the most part, don't understand how the data might be used outside of the sole system in which they're working. They are looking at a graphic interface. They enter things in a form, and they don't understand how to export data. Um, so some of the more progressive cities are having uh, building offices that support this kind of stuff with people who specialize in these kind of reformatting and ETLs and dealing with um, this sort of archaic infrastructure. Um, in Philadelphia, the only place you could find a listing of the parking reg regulations at the street level was in the city code in text format. Um, and this is just the residential parking permit districts, of which there are about 34. They cover the city. And so I figured I might as well start with the one layer that I could find. Um, there are about five or six different sorts of rules you need to take into account if you wanted to present a comprehensive index of where you can park and when. Um, so I started with this. This is June, I think. Um, I've been playing with Mapbox and CartoDB for maybe a month. And one night I was just sort of obsessed, and I decided that I was going to draw all the polygons by hand. Um, there's certainly nothing geocodable about this. So. Um, this was the map, and it's just a stupid bunch of polygons with numbers on it now. I didn't even replace the right numbers. Now they're, um, the numbers are overlaid, so you don't even have to click on anything. But because it's done in Mapbox, um, it looked pretty swell on mobile devices, and that was the case um, in which I thought most people would be uh, trying to access these sorts of rules. 
The weird thing is you can't find this data anywhere else on the PPA's website. The way you apply for a residential parking permit in Philadelphia is to go to their website, download a PDF, and mail it to them with a check. It's 2015. <laughs> um, still, it's still this way. So I thought it might be useful, and I always wondered how big the districts were as well. Um, one of the reactions that I got when I showed this to a friend was they didn't realize, um, this is the central, this is uh, center city of Philadelphia. They didn't realize that their parking zone was so large and they wondered why they could never find any spots. Um, much later after I built this um, layer, uh, I got uh, someone write to know the number of permits that were issued per district and we, we found that, I mean, they don't even look at how many they're issuing, they just send them out. So there's, a multiple levels of, of dysfunction happening in there. And this is only for residential parking permits. So if you're on a block where there are rules for metered spaces, um, those apply if you don't have a, par a residential permit. But if you do, and you have the right sticker on your car, then you can park there for a totally different set of time. <laughs> um, and then we haven't even gotten into talking about like handicapped spaces and other kinds of special permitting and valet zones. So. All I did was tweet this um, after staying up until about 3 a.m. Um, again, this was all really new and I'd never done anything like it and it was uh, pretty empowering to be able to just put it on a map and send it to my mom and she could use it on her phone. Um, I didn't even know what the difference is, like what a vector tile was. <laughs> so, I mean, it was pretty interesting. So I tweeted this at 10 a.m. the next morning on a Friday and um, I think by noon, I had gotten a call from a, this local tech blog um, that wanted to write a story on it. Again, there's a dearth of any kind of map-based information on parking in Philly, despite the fact that it's got these really complicated rules. So I just briefly described what I'd done, and I think they send out an email every day at 1 p.m. with all of their, their new stories. And I think by maybe, I'm trying to think. A couple hours later that the map had something like, and these are tile loads, right, so the number is much lower, but um, I think Mapbox counts 15 tiles as a, as a map view. And so there were like 17,000 of those on this silly thing that I made the night before. Um, so I don't know if you divide that by 15, it's still like 1,200 people looking at this map. So um, it was just, it was an interesting testament to how how much autonomy the web gives us now, especially with these new tools. Um, I mean, when you t start talking about CAR2DB, I've essentially had no background in SQL or database configuration, and I could get a, a geodatabase up and running. I started learning SQL backwards by using CAR2DB, because you can write the, the queries on the right-hand side and then see it immediately on the map. So, I, and it's just, <laughs> it still blows my mind. Um, so the, an interesting thing happened as a result of that, right? Um, the PPA called me <laughs> after seeing that story in that blog. Um, and they asked why I made it. <laughs> and I said, well, because you didn't. <laughs> and they kind of thought for a minute. And then they invited me to come in for a meeting. And again, in Philadelphia, it's, it's, super, it's sort of an extra layer of awkward because I was just a civilian at the time I was working for um, in higher education. But they um, invited me to come into their offices, and again, it's a state agency. So I wasn't even talking with the city, I was just talking to a state agency in sort of, it was, yeah, and I, at the time, didn't even understand what was happening. So I got into a conversation, I went in and met with them, and they thought it was fascinating. They wanted to know more about open data, and since I'd been attending these Code for Philly meetups, um, I could give a little bit of a background, and I happened to know the city's chief data officer because he comes to those meetups every week. And I had a hunch that it was probably pretty, highly desired um, set, at least the, the regulations, if not parking ticket data. And so I basically wrote this email that was a primer on open data and the fact that Philadelphia has a whole office that can help you get this stuff out of the machines. And, and because they were everybody's first concern is, oh, we don't have the money to spend, we have to transform this data. And I said, well, you know there's staff for that. And even though it's your state agency, it's, the data's about Philadelphians. So, you know, how would you like to meet this guy? So I was able to arrange a meeting with, between the city and the state agency, um, all because of a middle manager at the PPA who was sort of forward thinking. Um, another layer of complication in Philadelphia is that the state of Pennsylvania tends to skew pretty Republican, Republican, sorry, now I'll lose my 
and the city, of course, is, is primarily demographic, uh, den, I can't say the word. Dem democratic. And so it's another level because this agency t tends to be a bastion of Republican workers in a city full of Democrats. Um, all these little subtle layers to all of this. So they're not necessarily incentivized to work together in the city too much. One of the other complicating factors is that there are four agencies in the city of Philadelphia that are authorized to hang and enforce signage. For that, that involves parking, just about parking. So there's the city, there's the streets department from the city, there's the Philadelphia Parking Authority, which is a state agency, there is the, um, the Philadelphia Police, which has some selected areas where they can hang and enforce signage, and then there's SEPTA, which is the Southeastern Pennsylvania Transit Authority, um, which I guess is like BART, or UNI maybe, I don't know, as it operates all the bus systems and the light rail, regional rail in the, in the area. And they can all hang and enforce parking signage, except that has their own police. The PPA is enabled, is, they're not actually police officers, but they're enforcement officers. And the, none of those agencies talk to one another. No one has a crossover reference for whose laws, whose regulations are, are enforced where. Um, so we're used to this experience now, this is sort of going a little bit backwards, where you know, we can get everything on our phone. I can, I can go on my phone and a car will appear in front of me and take me somewhere. But you know we're using PDFs to apply for a parking permit that we have to do every single year, um, and it sort of just begs this question: What you know? You'd think the government would start start to get a clue somewhere, maybe because there's money that they're leaving on the table as well with this stuff. Um, so after I met with the PPA and connected uh, the city with this uh, state agency, I think. Probably a month or two later, the city contacted me and said, well, you know, we're opening up a new position in the open data services department. Are you interested in applying? And I had never considered working for the government in my life. It was like the last thing I ever thought I would do. Um, I come from the performing arts for 10 years. I worked in, in the arts. I went to college for music. And it just sounded like crazy talk. Um, but in the meantime, I flew out and attended the Code for America Summit in San Francisco. And so I sort of was, I don't know, you could say captivated by all the possibilities uh, by opening up data. Um, right now, uh, the city itself has only, this is the PPA, has only available about 12 parking garages that you can search online, that's it. No street rules, none of the other things that I mentioned earlier. Um, and this is like the parking finder on the PPA's website. Um, and it's, it's just like you can search and like, you know, it'll give you one that's like three miles away from whatever you're looking for because that's the closest um, location. So one of the wrinkles that we run into, there's a lot of national level um, companies that are, that are aggregating this kind of stuff and even doing sort of, you know, plan ahead reservations and give you all the rates from the private providers as well. But there, no one has street level data for, for Philly and, and frankly a lot of other cities. Um, what we find is the only thing you can usually get out of a government is a listing of either all the signage on the streets or all of the meters on the streets and then the attached rules. Um, and you can see there are holes in the data there. That's because the database is so old that if there was more than one set of rules for one, these are, this is actually parking kiosks. This is what the PPA did have available. It's just the kiosks on the street, and we have, there's sort of those multimeter things where you can put money in and pay, a, um, it prints out a ticket, but you can park anywhere along an entire block. We don't have delineated spaces or individual meters. So if there's more than one set of rules for different times of day or days of week, it just writes it down and doesn't keep a key, the, there's no key pair, there's no uh, primary key between these. So if you're gonna try to dump this in a database to reference it, good luck. So um, that's when I started learning about R. Um, it's been a heck of a year, <laughs> um, and uh, was lucky to have a friend help me. You see the asterisk at the top of the screen? That happened about every 20 lines. Do you know why? Yes. This was this software is from the time when this the manifest would be printed out on the dot matrix printers with the holes in the side, so it had a header every 20 bars when you export it. 
So that's the age of the system we're working with. There's no geocoding this data. Um, in fact, there isn't, there's no, this is actually, I'm still working on this now. Um, I ended up accepting the job and going to work for the city. Um, I started in December, so I am in my first quarter, or just finished my first quarter. Um, and it's amazing. The city of Philadelphia has <coughs> enabled people that work in this one little department, Office of Innovation and Technology. There are high quality developers that are choosing to take time out of a career in which they can make far more money elsewhere because this opportunity exists right now. And we are being given the freedom and the resource to improve things. Um, just not parking data yet. Um, so we actually have had a few initial meetings with, uh, with the, parking, uh, the parking authority. Um, we ran into a couple of snags. Uh, my, my initial contact, the guy that brought me in, um, is departing for DC. So we may well, this is another thing that you run into with open data, when your contact leaves, you have to start all over again convincing someone else. And it's just the reality of the situation. Um, this is another sort of data set that, that was uh, it surfaced, I think I was talking to a reporter who said he'd gotten it from a council person who, anyway, it's a PDF of all of these residential lots. They're off street lots in Philly, there are about 50 of them. The listing doesn't exist anywhere else in this weird PDF manifest. And so that's another layer that I drew by hand because I think that surface lots should be polygons instead of like a point. Some of them have 300 spots in them. Um, in my dream world, I have mapped entrances and exits because in a city with a lot of one-way streets, that's a relevant consideration. Um, anyway, I'm trying to blow through this because we got started a little bit late. This is uh, the state of the data that I've been able to assemble. Now, these are somewhat questionably accurate geocoded kiosks um, with associated rules. The ultimate conclusion that we've gotten now after speaking with the PTA so far, I don't believe that they actually have any real geographic data at all. And, and when I say that, I mean like, yes, they've got intersections mapped for this stuff, but <laughs> I mean, it's just, there's no, no one there really uses it or understands how it could help them. I don't know, how, they're not looking at the, the parking ticket data, they're not looking at where their most uh, income generating like intersections are. I think that to me that could be indicative of a signage problem. Um, which is another thing. Sometimes in Philadelphia, you'll have a, a, U, uh, a U channel uh, sign pole with five different sets of signs on it stacked up. Um, so one of the other cool things, there's a project coming out in New York by a girl named Nikki, so I can't say her last name, um, to park or not to park. Um, I didn't get it in my presentation, but she's working on redesigning parking signage um, so that you can condense what is now like five, New York has this too, five different sets of rules into like one comprehensive, easy to read sign. And I'm really interested in that because I'd like to incorporate something like that into this, which is the mock-up of a web application that I'm in the middle of building. I've, yep, I've got a, um, a, a developer that's helping me set up some of the back end stuff at um, Code for Philly. And it's still entirely a civic project right now. Um, these are the layers that we're in search of. So the street parking is still the one that's up in the air because we have the consideration that parking on a street is not a point-based situation. It's, it's gonna be a line segment. Um, and there's no map or even in the city's um, base layer situation, uh, um, data sets that, is, that maps anything close to that. We have curb lines for the city of Philadelphia. We have street center lines there's a high likelihood that I'm gonna end up drawing the layer all from, from scratch because there's no way to intersect those in a way that's actually gonna take into account the weird sets of time rules that Philadelphia has. So part of a block might be a loading zone only between two hours in the morning, but the rest of it will be fine for the rest of the day. So even if you were able to um, you know, do calculations on the fly or intersect um, maybe parcels with the center lines file or parcels with the curb lines file to create sort of line segments to map the data to. And forgive me if I use the wrong words, I'm still using, I'm still learning what all of the things are. I know what I wanna do, I just don't know all the terminology. Um, so we, you know, that's the next layer. It, it would be really nice and useful just to even have the points, right? Because obviously if you're driving on the street, you can kind of figure out where it's okay to park and where it's not. I, in a perfect world, this is what I'd want. Um, everybody that's ever looked at SF Park knows 
that they mapped real-time availability using the line segments. Um, that was only for a small portion of the city, though. Um, and so this is probably, you can't see it in the ones that I've drawn on, but here, there are all these curb cutouts in the very, very center part of the city, and, and most of the parking is nested sort of in these curb cutouts um, in Philadelphia. So one of the things that I'm working on doing is probably doing that by hand. There is a myth that all the parking regulations that the PPA owns, is, it lives inside this Google Drive folder somewhere. I'm not kidding. <laughs> I haven't seen it yet. We haven't had the meeting yet with the right people to get it released, but I doubt that it includes anything that's georeferenced. Um, and so I want, I want it to happen. I want to get it done, and it's probably faster to just build it, as crazy as that sounds. Um, I was actually told there's actually yet a third agency that deals with this kind of info in Philly, the Bureau of Administrative Adjudication, which is designed to be <laughs> sort of this third party that you can go protest your tickets to. And it was also built to keep um, parking um, out of parking uh, suits out of criminal court, because that's just crazy. And it would bog down the first judi judicial district um, intolerably. So they actually are the owners of the ticket data, and the PPA generates the data. They are a city agency <laughs> that reports to the director of finance for the city. Um, it's incredible. So <laughs> in fact, they could release the parking ticket data um, without even having to ask the PPA. Now, that's not probably a good move, um, but we're actually pretty close to seeing parking violation data much before we might get the actual regulation. Data. In fact, it's probably going to be a situation where we end up helping the PPA create their own um, geodata. For their, it's yeah, these are real things. Um, and then, so to wrap up, in my dream world, then this application becomes. And ignore the specifics up there. This is a mock-up I was doing for something else. Its own source of open data, right? So we can see the queries where people are most frequently searching and then can be fed possibly back to the city, maybe to the planning commission or to um, L&I or any sort of the related streets, the streets department um, for plowing decisions, things like that. I know it's not perfect, but since folks are gonna be, it's, you know, it'll be searchable by um, distance, rate, um, time period, and any of the other um, parameters that are included in the data we see. Um, so, you know, most folks on the web, on the, browser on your phone, in order to get geo geolocated, you have to get permission, you know, HTML5 requires you to say yes, it's okay. So we're gonna have the location data for these queries. Um, and so the next task is to build a backend dashboard to sort of report on that, and then possibly find a way to normalize and hand that off to the city. So this is not a unique problem to Philadelphia. Um, there are a lot of other cities that would like to do something like this. and. For all my naivete, I think that we should have something for parking data like exists for public transit data. I think there should be a spec. So I'm proposing that we create a spec. Um, it can be similar in format. If you're not familiar with GTFS, it's a standard that actually predates Google, but Google adapted in order to feed this data through when you search um, for how am I gonna get into San Francisco on the BART um, tonight at 9 p.m. I think you should be able to search the same thing in, in Google. You know, if you're looking. But I also don't think that anybody should own this data. It's fine to, you know, enterprise is great. You can build applications on top of it. I use the public transit app that I like better than the one that SEPTA has at home. I think that's how it should be. But I don't think that anyone, um, private enterprise, should own public parking data, um, which is, in a couple places, become an, an issue while people have started to sort of get tired of waiting and build their own, their own data set. So. I kind of want to build it for the city and open source it and figure out how um, we can get that automated on an ongoing basis. This is a repo where I'm hoping to start building this. Um, I actually just threw it up over the weekend. Um, but as I start thinking about how to um, create, uh, how to architect the database around this, it's relevant to have this conversation and I thought maybe we could have it on a national level. Um, there are a few, if you're familiar at all with some of the OpenStreetMaps discussions, there are a few threads that, have, that go back to even 2009 talking about a standard. Um, but I think trying to solve that problem on an international level is a little bit crazy pants right now. I think that there are too many variables. Um, 
And I think that the GTFS thing works for us nationally right now. And I don't see, I don't know. I, this could be pie in the sky, so please feel free to tell me that it's a silly thing to, to dream of. But that's sort of what I want to get out there right now. So um, you can reach me at these places if anybody's interested in working on this. And yeah. Um, I'm wondering, uh, the Department of Public Works is bringing their edge basement class. A what? Edge basement. Yeah. Um, and that might help you find that out. Is that the, is that would be the equivalent of like the curb line? Yeah. Okay. So we have that. Yeah, that was actually the, I had that layer in there. Yeah, the cutouts. So the cutouts, the wrinkles, they're not all parking. <laughs> some of them are, some of them have changed. Um, the crazy thing about the residential areas is that a block can actually flip flop. They can decide, get, they can get together, and if over half of the block signs a petition, then it goes to city council, who then has to make an, waste their time making an announcement, a decision for this block to go permit. And then, you know, the next year, a new neighbor moves in and starts a petition that says, I don't want our block to be permit parking only, and it flips back and forth. So both the signage and the enforcement is insane. I didn't have time. I wanted to write up sort of all of the, not the exact regulations, but sort of all of the bizarre cases that I've come across. Um, I'm going to start documenting that in um, edge cases and everything. Yeah? Uh, this always seems like a judgment question, but being from Philadelphia, uh -huh. do you worry about I'm going to answer you with a story. <laughs> so the PPA has handheld enforcement tool. It's a, like a PDA, and it's got a thermographic printer inside. And um, most of the models of these types of devices have an external battery pack that's belt mounted. Um, and you can carry more than one battery to supply power to the device itself and then the printer separately. And in fact, they're interchangeable. So if I start running out, I can swap in a different battery. The system that the PPA uses has an all-in-one unit, and the battery is inside. And so you can only charge them on the dock. And um, PEO shifts are eight plus hours long. And the, the devices are enabled with um, GPS. Um, however, because they, I don't want to sound very critical, but chose this particular device six years ago, they, um, they are not able to uh, enable the GPS because it drains the battery more quickly than a shift would be over. So the parking violation data is open-ended text field entry. So they're not mapping anything right now. I mean, and if they are, they're doing it sort of anecdotally. Um, so like I got a test set of, public, of parking violation data and I had to geocode it myself the, to add when, uh, on top of that, they, they classify everything manually on, by sides of street, but they do it by cardinal direction, and some of them have very different senses of what cardinal direction are. Yeah, so um, hopefully you can read between the lines there uh, in the short term. I am a public servant, therefore I can't. What? <laughs> yes? Um, the, does the city or the state mm -hmm. actually go out to the, to the bigger park? Yeah, I mean, this agency is self-contained in Philadelphia. It's just the money goes to it. So there's no private company that does this that might have an asset management system that would no. know where they are? Xerox manages the violation data as it's passed off to the BAA, which is why they can, they can release that data to us. <coughs> um, it, it's, it's just simply the database of the violations. And, and the output of that is like, I think they might have pick lists now for street names at least, so that but the problem is we have a street, we have a road called, uh, it's a pretty big four to six lane highway that cuts across the city, JFK Boulevard. Um, there were five permutations of that name in the database of, in the, the test set of 1300 lines that I got. And that was just for FedEx delivery trucks for one month. Thank you. Uh, we gotta cut off, I'm sorry. We gotta leave state. So